Welcome to the Geo Gearheads. This is a weekly show about geocaching and geolocation games. I, tonight, am your host, Chris of the Northwest. Unfortunately, Daryl is under the weather and won't be joining us, but that's okay. We've got a randomized show, one of my favorites, and we're going to jump right into it. So if you have anything to add, toss that into the chat, and I will do my best to keep it going while reading all these wonderful stories. We're going to start off with an email from Starcasher. He wrote, on the cache maintenance show, I indicated that I use my color laser printer and a box of letter-sized right-in-the-rain paper and downloaded internet forms to create most of my log sheets. I thought I would send the sites I use for the forms for a reference. Uh, I use the log forms from techblazer.com. Hold on. I'm copying that and pasting it into the log. And I pasted first. Let me paste second. Copy first. You know, copy once, paste twice. Wait. No, copy twice, paste once. That's how it should go, right? Anyway, he goes on to say, I use the log forms from techblazer.com as they provide a variety of log widths in both black and white and color and with or without FTF sections at the top. No, oh, that's really nice. Uh, he goes on, I also indicated that I print double-sided logs. However, if you take the above log forms and print them on both sides, the vertical edges of the individual printed logs do not line up on both sides. That means when I use my paper cutter to separate the individual logs, the back sides would look odd. So instead, on the back side of the log sheet, I use a full sheet ruled or lined form and it's just the form that creates a blank sheet of lined paper where the lines stretch from left to right edges personally i use one use one with the half centimeter line separation uh, such as this pdf and there we go put that into the chat as well you can keep up uh, if you're watching live great uh, let me know what you're using for your log sheets. If you're watching later, don't forget to send us an email. We would love it. Geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com. Uh, let's see. GSM times two says I've used those for a number of years. I'm assuming the uh, log sheet. So great. Thank you, GSM times two. We sure appreciate that. So, yeah, let us know what you're using to make your logs. Are you just using regular paper or using right in the rain paper? Uh, what do you use in your log sheets or for your log sheets? Do you just, you know, grab a receipt from the store because that's what you had in the car and toss that in? Let us know. Uh, you know, there's some environments. Let's let's pick on GSM times two uh, where, you know, in Southern California, you got a pretty dry environment. You you can really work with just about anything you get. So a right in the rain paper may not be necessary where, you know, just standard printer paper would work fine. So uh, anyway, going on, we've learned a little bit more about the community celebration events coming up. The geocaching blog has the celebrate 20 years of geocaching at community celebration events. Beginning today, and this was last week, eligible geocachers can apply to host community celebration events in 2020. These events will enable cachers around the world to commemorate the 20th anniversary of geocaching with a new icon and souvenir. This cache type was originally known as the Lost and Found Event Cache. It was created for events that were hosted by geocachers from April 30th to May 3rd, 2010. So you got you had four days in 2010 to attend some of these events. I believe I attended three during that time. I know people who got in well more than 10, you know, got into double digits. Uh, I kind of, you know, I, 
I have to admit, I, I have some mixed feelings here. I'm really glad uh, for the community um, celebration events, but at the same time, I kind of like that I have this exclusive lost and found event cache icon that, you know, if you didn't join in 2010, sorry, you didn't get it. Um, but you know, Hey, that's just me. Um, you know, we've got some questions in the chat. I'm going to get to them in a little bit. I want to finish this topic. Then we can jump back to the logs. So, uh, in or between April 30th and May 3rd, 2010, just 362 lost and found events were held. So a very limited number of cachers earned the icon. We're excited that many thousands more cachers will have the chance to celebrate the big anniversary and get the redesigned icon in 2020. To be eligible to apply to host a community celebration event, you must meet the following criteria. You must have attended at least two events or CITOs within the last three years. That's between December 2nd, 2016 and December 2nd, 2019. You must have logged a cache within the past six months. That's June 2nd, 2019 to December 2nd, 2019. Really, folks, if you're listening to the show, you qualify, right? I mean, uh, two events in three years, that's pretty easy to do. I mean, if you want to be, you know, Steadfast, you could hit more than an event a month without a problem. Okay. Uh, if you meet the, I, that, <laughs> yes, that's right. If you meet the criteria, apply via the opt in page by June 3rd, 2020. So you've got about six months. I wouldn't wait. Uh, if you own multiple geocaching.com accounts, yeah, I'm looking at you, GSM times two. Please apply with only one account. Each month from January through October, at least 2,220 or 2020 hosts will be randomly selected from those who opt in. If selected, you'll receive one of the, are you ready for this? 20,200 or more community celebration events. All official community volunteers, that's reviewers, moderators, and translators, and the primary accounts for all the mega and giga events in 2020 will automatically receive a celebration event. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot to take in right there. Basically, if you've ever been to an event or ever found a cache, okay, you know, if you've been to an event within the last uh, three years and been and found a, a cache within the last six months, and like I say, if you're listening to this show, you qualify. Go over to geocaching.com, find that page. And all you have to do is click, hey, I want to host an event and you're in. Now, they're going to um, start picking winners in January. And they're going to do um, 2,000 hosts per month, randomly selected with geographic distribution. Um However, the first event will start May 2nd, and that day was picked on purpose, May 2nd, 2020, through December 31st, 2020. So remember that these events must be a minimum of two hours. That's the first time I've heard the minimum of two hours for an event and cannot overlap with events associated with a mega or giga event. Hmm. Interesting. Now, um, May 2nd is what we in the geocaching community call the big blue switch day. That's the day that selective availability was turned off and that uh, we were able to have far better accuracy with our GPSs. I like to say it's the only good thing that came out of the Clinton administration. I could be wrong about that. Now, so go Register for your uh, community celebration event and start planning where you're going to do it. You know, you're, you, you can get them. Uh, you know, so let's say you're not selected in January. That's OK. They will continue to keep a list of those uh, geocachers that are interested and have qualified. And maybe you'll get it in February, March, April, May. They're going to do it through October. So January to October, they're going to choose 
who gets these events. And then May through December is when the events will take place. So I hope all that's just as clear as mud because actually it makes a little bit of sense, but it, it would it kind of be a bummer to get one in January. No, you have to wait five months before you can put an event to, together, but it gives you time so that these events don't all stack up on the same day and they get to be spread out um, and you know, not all bunched up with uh, maybe mega events or what have you. Okay, back to the logs. We have uh, people in the chat here who are telling us what they use for their logs. Um, okay, so let's see. GSM times two likes the hint about the lined logs on the back. Just, you know, using a lined sheet, um, you know, lined paper that you can easily find in a PDF. We put the link here in the uh, chat if you're interested. Ian uses regular old paper. I have a custom log sheet with our state association logo I created. Well, that's very nice. I like that. Uh, <laughs> I, I said I was picking on GSM times two. He says, pick on me anytime you want. I use regular paper and very and a very old laser printer. Uh, Francis wants to know where you can get eight and a half by 11 sheets of right in the rain paper. Well, my first guess is look on Amazon. Um, I happen to live in the Northwest near the right in the rain factory, I guess you would call it, uh, plant, you know, where they, they do their secret process to the paper. Uh, you know, you can walk in, you know, their factory store is, really kind of pitiful looking. I've seen better displays in some of the geocaching stores, some of the um, uh, big box stores, hardware stores usually have good supply of right in the rain paper. I don't think the sporting stores like REI carry it anymore, um, but you can get a ream of 11 and a half or eight and a half by 11 uh, right in the rain paper. And then, you know, just go to town. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that may, I, I'm just thinking out loud, that would be a great gift for any gift exchanges that you're doing here in the holiday season. Excuse me one moment. So maybe, um, you know, a handful of right in the rain sheets of paper rolled up with a bow on it would make a dandy, I, I want to say a white elephant gift, uh, but, you know, some some gift for the gift exchange. <clears throat> Ian says, I thought about using more of the right in the rain paper, but people ruin logs constantly. Anyhow, I'm always replacing them. Well, you know, they can ruin logs by not putting them back into the container properly. You know, if they, I'm thinking nanos or micros, if they don't roll up the log, put it into the lid and then put it in to the container. Uh, if they shove it down into the container and just screw that lid on there and cram that log down in there it's it's a bugger to get out uh, uh gsm times two says this is just an estimation half of the geocachers were not geocaching in 2010 and 50 percent of the geocachers from 2010 are no longer caching i welcome the rejuvenation ian thought it was funny we're going back to the uh celebrate 20 years of geocaching at the community events Two events in three years. Yeah, that's that's pretty generous. And at least two events. Yeah. Um, GSM times two says with two, 20,200 events, everyone should be able to get the icon. And yes, it's definitely going to be a fun year, Ian. Interesting thing that uh, 2020, about 2020, it's, it's throwing a wrench in the mega event planning for organizers. We're trying to figure out how to include everything in our weekend of fun. Ooh, you, you know, I wonder, and I'm just thinking out loud, how um, the big 2020 events here in the Northwest with the headquarters celebration and then a week later, uh, Geo Woodstock uh how that is going to affect travel. I mean, are people going to not travel to other events because, well, you know, they got all their traveling done in one week. 
I hope that's not the case. Okay. Let's go on. Now, more from the geocaching blog. We see that um, we, we're looking at GIF 2019 in review and the upcoming intermission. So this past November, over 17,000 geocachers attended a geocaching international film festival event. That's what I like to call GIF. Is it GIF? Is it GIF? If you put both sounds in front, you're never wrong. It's GIF. They celebrated the 16 GIF finalists from their movie theater chairs, living room couches, and select outdoor locations across the world. Overall, it was another great reminder of what we love about geocaching and how diverse it can be. Over 11 days, geocachers logged over 18,000 uh, attended logs on registered GIF events. Clearly, some cachers attended multiple GIFs for that extra bit of GIFferent fun with movies and GIF gnomes. <laughs> I, I went to two. I attended two events. I attended our local one and then one up at uh, headquarters. Uh, here are some more GIF 2019 numbers. The first time with two GIF weekends, November 7th to 17th, uh, 2019. I like that idea. Spread it over two weekends. You know, it makes it 11 days long, the GIF season, but uh, it allows you to attend more. I like that. 54 film submissions from 22 different countries, 16 finalist clips from 10 different countries, Five of the 2019 finalists had been GIF finalists before. So that kind of shows you that maybe there's a niche here developing. 688 total events in 56 different countries. First ever draw for the Signal Award. That's the, uh, you know, who likes this film the best award. Uh, 11,000 votes for the People's Choice Award. With GIF 2019 behind us, we wanted to talk about the future of GIF. You know, after GIF is before GIF, they say. Uh, with all the exciting things that are ahead for us in 2020, you know, we've already talked about it. GIF will take a brief intermission until the credits roll on the festivities. GIF as a whole is, is fueled by amazing community members, and we're excited to see the films that will be made once it resumes so there will be no film festival in 2020 it will resume in 2021 what that means is you've got an extra year to get those ideas down you know work them out polish them and i'm looking for some excellent films in 2021 um Wet Coaster says, I've been going to the same mega event for the last three years. Can't go this year. Same day as Geo Woodstock 18. Um, Ian says, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the other megas are down in attendance, especially the ones around the same time as the Northwest events. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I'm thinking uh, event totals may be down all over because, you know, people only have so much money to travel. Let's see, Ian says, basically seven consecutive weeks of North American mega events. Some of those will lose traveling attendees. Well, just take seven weeks off. That's the answer. Just take a seven-week vacation, travel around the country, hit all the mega events, and, well, you may not have a job when you get back, but you'll have enjoyed yourself for seven weeks. You know, probably not the best idea. Hmm. Ideas presented by this host do not reflect the ideas and concepts of geo gearheads. I had to do that for Daryl. Um, GSM times two says, I will not be going to Yuma this year to save funds for the 2020 weekends. Ian says, I like the idea of spreading out the GIF, GIF events over 11 days. It allowed me to go to multiple events and see more friends. Um, he also says, uh, should make for some great films with more time. Interesting. GSM Times 2 says, there's some talk about the geocaching network of geovloggers putting something together to fill in for the GIF. It's in the early talking stages. Well, folks, you heard it here first. Interesting. There may be a fill-in 
or something similar to the GIF with the uh, geocaching networks of vloggers. Hmm. Now, we've got some feedback, some email from Mike D. Mike says, well, with the advent of iOS 13 on my iPhone 8, the Files app now allows access to external devices. You can access all the folders and subfolders on the external device and edit the contents. Whilst I use my Wi-Fi downloads of PQ to my 66, that would be the uh, uh, Garmin 66, I do like the, to physically transfer files, particularly keeping PQ on the SD card. Now this can be done without a PC. Uh, all you need is an Apple Lightning to USB 3 camera adapter. Cost about $29. I'm going to put up a shot here for y'all to see. The This uh, Lightning dongle with a USB female slot and a female Lightning power supply port, the $29 version currently available on Amazon is the USB only, no Lightning power pass-through. Um, so I download the PQ to the iPhone using the link in the PQ ready email. I save the zip files to download to the downloads folder. Here's a, a shot of the folders. Uh, the folder is kept for me in the iCloud drive. I connect the 66 to the adapter and the iPhone and the lightning power input. I use USB mode on the Garmin 66. I open the files app and you will see uh, the uh, inter alias on the 66 and the SD card separately. I find the download folder on the iPhone with the zipped PQ and it will auto unzip the file and then select the GPX file you want to transfer. Copy the file to the select target folder on the SD card and the file will be pasted. Job done. The PC is now redundant for this job. Ooh. How very nice. I wonder if there's anyone else doing that. Um, I do have one of, well, I have a SD card adapter and I do have a regular USB adapter for my iPhone. I still am not running iOS 13 for security reasons, but uh, I think they're getting close to tackling all those problems. So I may be jumping to 13 soon, and I really look forward to being able to do that. Uh, that means you can update your GPSR wherever you are, right? You, you can do it with cellular data. You can do it with Wi-Fi data at your favorite coffee stop. And um, that's, that's really nice. But you have to have that GPX file. And I'm trying to think if Cashly will let you do that. If it will let you save it to a location, then you can move that over to the GPSR. So you could just do it on the fly. You know, you, you, well, let's, let's say you fly into a new town and uh, while you're waiting for your Uber, you uh, pull up your phone, grab all the nearby caches, save those to a file. And uh, you could send that right over to your GPSR and be off and caching in nothing flat. I love that idea. Thank you, Mike D. Uh, Bryling also sent in an email. He says, I primarily use my Android phone for geocaching, including hiding caches. For years, I used an app called GPS Averaging, which was quite good at getting accurate coordinates. Unfortunately, earlier this year, the developer sold the app to another developer who promptly added ads to the app. Boo. Uh, this made the app stop working for its intended purpose and, the, and allowed ads to pop up even when the app wasn't in use. Ugh. I'm looking for an alternate app to use and was wondering if you or the GeoGearheads audience had any suggestions for apps uh, that perform the averaging function. Free or paid apps are both welcome. I prefer to throw a few bucks at a developer if they make a useful ad-free app. Well, Bryling, I don't know of anything for the Android. I, I have one for iOS, but, um, you know, to be honest, I haven't used it in a while. Um, hmm. 
I have found, and I, I'm sorry, I'm only speaking from iOS experience. I have found that several of the Compass apps that uh, will also show uh, your coordinates tend to do averaging. And those get me some really good coordinates. So maybe you want to look at that. Um <laughs> Ian says, uh, talking about the uh, the dongle that goes from, hello, here it is, from iPhone to GPSR. He says, that's pretty wild. We've come a long way from the early days of paper caching. Oh, man, have we? I remember I had a, I had a uh, notebook in the back of my car, three ring binder with the caches on it that I, you know, had to get in the town. And if anything new popped up, I had to print it you know, three hole punch it, put it in there. And uh, when you found one, then you could just tear that sheet out and throw it away. You didn't need it anymore. Oh, GSM times two says, ain't that the truth? I still, I think about that all the time. I still remember the folder I had in the back in the day with the printouts of 25 nearby caches when doing 25 a day took quite a bit of driving. <laughs> yes. Yes. And really, you know, why would you have more than 25? There, there was no reason, you know, that would probably cash out your town in the early days. Or, you know, you had to, for, for me in the Northwest, you had to drive up to the mountains, which, you know, you only got two or three in a day that way, but boy, were they worth it. Not saying they're not now, but it's different now. And different is not bad. Different is different. Okay, another story from iMore says, iPhone 11 GPS all wonky? You're not alone, it seems. Now, in the last couple of shows, I've talked about my iPhone 8 and how the GPS seemed wonky for a bit and then suddenly straightened out once I introduced it to a GPSR. Um, once I started dual caching, the phone, I think, got jealous and straightened, its, straightened itself out. So the, the iMore article says, uh, if you're struggling with an iPhone 11 or an iPhone 11 Pro uh, whose GPS just won't work reliably, you're not alone. In fact, over on Reddit, you'll find a few people reporting problems using Waze, Stravia, and more. One Stravia user has been working with the developer of the app to try and get to the bottom of things. And so far, they're blaming Apple. Uh, he says, I'm an athlete and I've tracked my data with Apple Watch since the zero and use the Garmin edge for my bike and iPhone seven plus I eight plus and now iPhone 11 pro to track my runs with the Stravia app. Ever since I got the 11 pro a month ago, my Stravia activities had me pacing much faster. My friends thought it was a fluke as did I until I started investigating my data deeply. I've been working with Stra Stravia directly, and they're stating that the iPhone 11 Pro is not tracking horizontal data correctly. Searching online leads me to a couple of posts, though not many. At this point, Stravia engineers are blaming my iPhone specifically for not tracking GPS data accurately, though I'm not having an issue with any other GPS app. Unfortunately, I don't have a way to test if it's iPhone or iOS 13, since that comes stock, the steel frame of the iPhone 11 Pro, perhaps the new antenna or GPS chip, I've tested every which way they've asked. Factory reset, clean install, iOS 13.2, 13.22, and 13.2.3. Ran with airplane mode on, Wi-Fi off, hop, skip, and jump to their request. To, the, to date, my GPS activities are all over the place. Uh, other users have chimed in to say they've also been having problems with GPS-enabled apps, including the popular Waze mapping app. One user says, my Waze has been super screwy for me lately on CarPlay with my 11 Max Pro. Pro Max, 11 Pro Max. Uh, the speed jumps all over the place and the position is rarely accurate. But wait, there's more. Been having issues similar with my iPhone 11 since I purchased it, says another user. Uh, my old iPhone 7 was much more accurate than my iPhone 11, 
which adds distance to all my runs, whether it's on Nike running club app, Stravia or run keeper. And these go on. These reports appear to be sporadic, sporadic, although they are all related to the 2019 iPhones. Whether that means it's a software or hardware issue, it's difficult to tell. It's also possible that the issue isn't as big as it appears, might appear. People with perfectly working iPhones don't post to Reddit after all. So there you go. Um, GSM times two is an Android user. I use an app that doesn't appear to be available anywhere anymore to uh, waypoint average. Ian says, speaking of the Apple Watch and how far technology has come, I just switched back from Android to iPhone again. I can use Cashly on my wrist to find a cache now. And I just saw a video, Ian, that if you're willing to jailbreak your phone, you can put Cashly up on your CarPlay screen and have it navigate to your cache for you. Mm, right? If you're willing to jailbreak your phone. Um, GSM times two is talking about waypoint averaging. He says, there seems to be others available, just not with geocaching in the name. Geocache placer is what I use. I can't find it in the play store. Uh, Ian is talking about his iPhone 11. He says, my speed jumps all over the place on ways with iPhone 11 pro also. I've noticed some weird issues with GPS stuff too. Never thought much of it. Uh, Ian, it would be interesting. Go ahead and, you know, plot your course on Waze and, uh, you know, see what your speed is. See if it's changing, if you're, you know, veering on or off the streets. Um, and, you know, let us know how accurate it is when using it for finding a GP, uh, GPS, finding a geocache. Um I'm curious to see if the GPS chip on the 11 is having issues or if it's just a few phones, you know, uh, manufacturing process on these chips, uh, you know, very wildly. So you could just have a bad chip as these people could, or it could be a serious issue with the iPhone 11. Yeah. Another friend of mine was talking about uh, Cashly and CarPlay too. Crazy. So there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. You there, the, if you're willing to jailbreak your iPhone, there is an app, I think it's car show or something to that extent where you can go in and say, I want this app, this app, and this app to display on CarPlay. And it just puts it up there. So on CarPlay, then you will have an icon that says Cashly or whatever you want. And uh, it works now. It's still using the processing power of your phone, obviously. So when you pull up Cashly and you pull up details, it's a little slow. And when you tell it to navigate to a cache, it takes a long time, you know, to, to figure out how to switch over to map mode and then display that. But it does it. Okay. Since this is a randomized show, we are just jumping around to random topics. <laughs> Surprise, right? <clears throat> Ellen and Railroad sent an email um, and said, I forgot which one of you said you use the Heil microphone. That, that's me. That's me. I'm the one using the Heil. It's a Heil PR40. Bob Heil is an interesting character and did a lot with the rock industry with concert sound, notably with the Grateful Dead, The Who, and Joe Walsh. He also created the talk boxes used by Peter Frampton and Joe Walsh on their hits. He created a series of podcasts with a lot of his stories. They are very interesting. And uh, if you head on over to Heil Sound, you can learn. Here, I'm going to copy that link for you. And uh, in fact, look at that. If you look at the picture there, he is using a Heil PR40. Now, Bob Heil... Uh, is is really an interesting character. Yes, he started with uh, the rock industry, but he was also into shortwave radio. And that's one of the reasons he created the microphone. He, he thought the microphones on the radios were terrible. And he says, well, we can just make a better microphone for them. So there you go. Um, 
Yeah, several other people seem to be using the uh, app Geocache Placer. It works great, but it's no longer in the Apple Store. <laughs> Ian loves the jumping and randomness. Doing a great job tonight, Chris. Thank you, Ian. It, uh, you know, well, jumping and random, that, that works well with me. So anyway, back to Bob Heil. See, jumping, somewhat random. Jumping back to what we were talking about. Um, I didn't know he had a, a series of podcasts. I'm going to have to go listen. Uh, I love the Heil PR40. I believe I got this. In fact, I know I did from Daryl. Daryl had it and uh, he prefers. I can't remember. I don't think it's Electra voice. Whatever, whatever microphone he has is the one he prefers. And he's like, I don't use this thing. I said, I want a Heil PR40. And uh, so I got it from him at a good price. And well, now you can hear my dulcet tones even better and more clear. If you're going to do a podcast, make sure you get a good microphone and a good audio mixer because that really makes the difference. Um, podcasts are, to me, all about sound. Yes, you can have the video. The video is fine. Uh, but you, if you watch a video on YouTube and you can't hear the sound, 80% of the people will not continue listening to that or watching that video. But if you even have a poor video and good sound, people will continue to watch it, watch and listen. Um, so just know that having good sound really makes the difference in podcast, blogs, what have you. Okay, I've got one more thing to talk about tonight. And it is completely random. Guess what? It doesn't have anything to do with GPSRs. It doesn't have anything to do with iPhone 11s. It doesn't even have anything to do with geocaching. Yes, this is completely random. This is from Engadget. AI-powered Lego sorter knows the shape of every brick. For some people, rummaging through a bunch of Lego bricks is part of the fun. But if you've got an enormous collection or take on complicated builds, you probably have a system for sorting your pieces. Your solution probably doesn't involve AI, though. YouTube user Daniel West combined his love for Lego with his engineering skills to build a universal Lego sorter that uses a neural network to identify, classify, and organize plastic pieces more effectively than a human could. The universal Lego sorter, which is made up of 10,000 Lego bricks, it took two years to, to design, build, and perfect. Folks, this isn't something your kid's going to build over Christmas break. Uh, six Lego motors and nine servo motors power the conveyor belts and agitators that transport the pieces brick by brick to a video camera. A Raspberry Pi then processes the video feed and streams the data to a laptop, which runs an application called Convolution Neural Network. The AI-driven software compares each piece to a database containing 3D models of every Lego piece ever created. Once the neural network matches the piece to a part number, it sends the brick back to the sorter, at which point uh, it knows which of the 18 sorting buckets to place it in. The machine processes one brick about every two seconds. Hmm. You know, if you've got a big collection, that's going to take a while, but in the end, you're going to have something you can really use. Creations like this highlight the flexibility of Lego as a building platform. Little kids can snap bricks together to create simple objects, while older kids and adults can engineer startlingly, starting, startingly, mm, starting, startingly. I can't say that word. Amazingly effective pieces of hardware when bringing technology into the equation. Amazon and Lego are currently running a contest that integrates Lego with technology. The two companies have tasked builders with integrating Alexa voice commands with Lego Mindstorm sets and will reward the best creations with a trip to Denmark and Amazon gift cards. Ooh, boy. There's a uh, new TV show coming out about a, a Lego building contest. Um, this should be interesting. GSM times too, because says, can it spot Lego on the floor when the lights are out? That's the machine I want. <laughs> well,
Well, you know what? That's that's where you need your Roomba to be attached to the have a video camera and attached to the um, the neural network, so it can identify the piece and determine whether it can suck it up or if it's too big for its brushes to pick up, and it just has to push it effectively out of the path. Uh, GSM times two. I'll wait while you go ahead and design that on a neural network. I'm waiting. Have you done it yet? No? Okay. Gary and uh, Francis both say amazing and wow. Yeah. Isn't that cool? You can do this with Lego. Folks, thank you for joining us tonight. Now, next week we... Uh, well, we, because it's the royal we. I'm including Daryl. Come, Daryl. Come. Come back. We'll be talking about FTFing with a couple of guests. Oh, and uh, GSM times two has done it. Thanks. I knew you could. Well, if you're looking for AI neural networks, why don't you check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all of our all of our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners. So leave us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through the many channels of social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. The show's copyright 2019 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Yeah. <laughs>